This is a follow-up to my tutorial on connecting objects using the data transfer and shrink wrap modifiers. I had a handful of people ask me whether it was possible to export this procedural integration to other 3D applications such as Unreal Engine. And the answer is yes, with one small asterisk. I'm also going to show you how we can take this setup and apply a procedural texture to it so it's seamless. So let's first talk about the integration of this data with other 3D applications via an export process that maintains this transferred normal data. Let's come over here and take a look at this. We can clearly see that it looks nice. Everything is blending well. If we come down and take a look at this in our modifier stack, we have the three modifiers that we took a look at in the previous tutorial. We have shrink wrap, subdivision, and data transfer. If I turn off a data transfer, then I turn off shrink wrap, then you can clearly see that I'm just simply using both of them to make these two objects appear as though they're one seamless object. So if we come back over here, let's turn shrink wrap back on, and then we'll look at this in a 3D viewport. Without the data transfer modifier, the disconnected meshes are clear. But as soon as I turn on that data transfer, you can see them blend together. So you've gotten your model set up and you're thinking about needing to export this to another 3D application. I'm going to select both of these objects because these are the two objects that I want to export. When you export 3D geometry, most of the exporters will ask whether you want to apply the modifier. So if we come over, look at our export formats, we've got Collada, which is an older format, but still very useful, Alembic, uh, Universal, and then we come down to OBJ, which is like an old workhorse exchange format for 3D data. We've got FBX and the GLTF. So all of these, will export this data. The only one that I saw that was kind of glitchy was FBX. Let's go ahead and test the Lembic, for instance. The exporters are going to be similar, but each one is going to sort of have different options. Let's only export the selected objects. And then we want to come down and make sure that we're exporting normals. That's important. Some of the exporters will ask you specifically to flatten the modifiers. And this one doesn't, but we do want to apply the subdivision for this to work correctly. And then we export and let's come over and just create a new scene. Let's remove the default cube like any good tutorial. And we will come in and we will import the Alembic file that we've just generated right there. And when we look at it, we can see our object. Now, if we look at this in just the basic viewport, we can see that it's applied the subdivision for both of the objects. Now, when we come back in and we turn on viewport shading, we've lost the material, but you can carefully see that we've got that normal data has been retained. So let's come over and create a material that we can see this a little bit more clearly with. Let's apply that here also. And there we can see that that data was retained. So it's important to note that when we select this object, if we come down here to the object data properties, the normal information got embedded and encoded into the polygon mesh structure, and it lives right up here in geometry data. If you see this clear custom split normals data, that's an indication that the polygon mesh has at least some normal data that's embedded in the mesh. And by default, Blender will use that data as opposed to auto generating and interpolating normals based on the mesh itself. So this is something that's critical if, for instance, you're generating data coming in from a CAD application. You know, you're using Moi or Rhino or any CAD application that's generating a polygon mesh derived from a NURBS data set. The normals are actually being encoded into the polygon mesh from the NURBS data. And when you bring that into Blender, it brings in that normal information and you always want to use that. 
that data lives right here. So if you see that custom split normal data, then you want to use it. Every now and then when you bring in mesh data from another 3D application, it may have this. If the data is intended for use with subdivision surfaces, you can generally clear this. But in this particular case, we don't want to clear that. Let's go ahead and turn off our overlays and see what happens when we clear that. You can clearly see that we've lost that normal data. And I tested this with most of these export formats. The only one that was a 3D format that seemed to be problematic was FBX. So let's go ahead and take a look at applying a procedural texture to this setup. So let's say that we want to apply a seamless procedural texture to this object, even though it's technically two objects that really are unconnected apart from the data transfer and the shrink wrap modifiers that are giving a relationship between the two. Let's come down to our shader editor and we have the single material that I've generated. Uh, so let's do this. Let's come in here and press Shift A and let's add a noise procedural texture. We'll drop that right there. They're always sort of squished and that drives me nuts. But if I just come over here and connect these, Let's, let's go ahead and turn on something interesting like that, or maybe, yeah, like that. So we can clearly see that there's this procedural texture. So procedural textures are generated in 3D space, and they sort of, where the, the 3D structure, which is invisible to us, touches the object, it appears. And so that's why it's called 3D. Well, we've got the clear seam between these two, even though we have normals that are blended, and it would be nice to make this seamless. So let's press Control T to add our mapping and our texture coordinates. One way that you could get a texture to sync up between two objects is to use the object's texture space. So if we come down here for the bottom object, we've got texture space, and I already have it set up Usually it'll be applied with auto texture space. You could see when I turn that on, it changed this. So when we added the texture setup over here, the texture was automatically applied in generated space. And generated means it's going to use this texture space coordinate system. So if we come up here to the object properties and we come down to viewport display, you can see that there's a texture space indicator and we can turn that on. So that tells me what the texture coordinates happen to be and by default, it's gonna snap it to the bounds of the object. So I could come in and turn off auto texture space and manually put in a value, let's say 0.12, which is in meters. And then we could apply the same. I happen to already have the top cylindrical object in the same value of 0.12. But we still don't get the seamless texture happening between the two. I show you this because this is something that you could be tempted to go and do is try and get them to apply using generated because generated is very useful for some applications. But it turns out that the way to make this really work is to come down here and use object. So let's come over here and, and do object. What object does is it uses the object's origin and the object's local scale as a way of establishing a size reference for the scale of the procedural texture. So knowing that, the first thing that you want to do is just make sure that the two objects have the same scale. In this case, they're both 1.0. So the local coordinate system of both is also established at being exactly the same. So the two objects share that transform relationship, meaning they're basically in a default state. So that's, in, that's critical and important. So the next thing that we can do is come down to scale. I could apply a value of 10 and we could get that to look better, but we, we still have this very obvious scene. So the critical thing to do here is establish a center origin relationship for the texture between the two objects. We can do that in one of two ways. We can set each object's origin, which is the little orange dot there, to be the same or we can establish a reference object that we can use down here. So let's go the route of creating a reference object, and it's gonna serve two purposes in this case. Let's come down here to cube, press Shift and S, and we'll do cursor to selected to move the cursor there, and then we'll do Shift A, and let's come down and create an empty, just a basic plain axis empty, 
and we'll call this cube and cylinder. We'll take the cube, hold the shift key and drag it inside of that empty and the cylinder will drag that inside of there also. So this will act as an organizing function for us so that we're able to move both as sort of a unit. One thing that you can do, just as a really quick side note, if you happen to organize objects this way, if I want to select this as an entire group, I can just select the top, press Shift and G, and then just come down and select Parent, and then I'm able to move both of those. This is a very common way I use to organize things. Now, back to what we're doing with the texture, I want in object mode to use this reference object as the origin for the texture for both objects. And so I could select that. And when we do it, then we get a seamless texture because the texture is looking at that origin point, which is being established by the empty. And that is how we can create a seamless texture across this object, this hybrid object that we're using with the shrink wrap and the data transfer modifier. So anyway, I hope you found this to be a useful tutorial.